Okay, I am going to, we're going to look at uh, Milton's Nativity Ode uh, today, but I wanted to very briefly give you a sort of a biographical sketch of Milton. Uh, before we begin with that, I think it's helpful to have some sense of the man uh, and his age, his uh, upbringing, his, uh, the, the formative influences on him, uh, that sort of sense, and also then how his career progresses. I think I had uh, said something about that last time, but I think I kept it too brief to be uh, uh, helpful in any way. Uh, he was born in 1608. 9th of December, uh, December, more specifically. And uh, we know him best for uh, Paradise Lost. But that work, uh, while his most famous, was not the only one that made him a famous poet. He was already, as I said, a, a well-reputed poet uh, long before uh, he wrote his major works at the very end of his life while he was uh, blind. Uh, that is part of the myth of John Milton, uh, and it really does almost become a myth, such that he, uh, in subsequent years, influences others as much by his person as by his uh, poetry. And so he represents not only the great epic poet of England, which he is without doubt, uh, but also a freedom fighter, a defense, uh, defender of uh, a certain brand of politics then. Uh, an anti-establishment figure, uh, iconoclast, if you will. And so um, I think his career makes himself interesting as well, and particularly on those that he influenced the most, namely the Romantic poets of England, who all wrote poetry imitating his and dedicated to many of the same sorts of themes in a different age. Remember, they wrote in the wake of the French Revolution, whereas Milton is writing in uh, against the backdrop of the English Civil War, the time of Commonwealth. And they saw themselves, that is the Romantics, as heirs of Milton doing the same thing that Milton himself had done. I think there are significant differences between them, but the, the overlap and the influence is uh, there without any doubt. Uh, one of the things, though, that contradicts the idea of himself as an anti-establishment figure is that he worked for the uh, Commonwealth. He was a civil servant, the Secretary of Foreign Tongues. Uh, as an, uh, he worked as an apologist, in other words, for Cromwell and what had happened in the uh, execution of Charles I. And uh, he had to defend that act. Uh, and he did so with, with aplomb. But before I um, get into that, let me look at the, his early life and his education, and a little bit further about uh, his life before I build up to that. Uh, he was born in London, <coughs> and his father was a composer, a musical composer, which I don't think is without significance. Milton himself was a, an accomplished musician, and it does help that, uh, I think, for, uh, to understand his intense uh, capacity for uh, musicality in his own prose. He hears the sounds uh, of the words that he also writes. Uh, it's very easily to get overwhelmed by just the substance and the meaning of what he writes without uh, and ignore the, the sound. Uh, but I think Milton is accomplished on both fronts. But uh, his father, John, uh, moved to London when he had been disinherited by his uh, Catholic father. John was a Puritan, and his father was a Catholic, and he disinherited him for that. That's not insignificant. Remember, this is the age of the Reformation. Uh, and um, he, uh, his father worked as a scrivener. He, he uh, worked with uh, engraving uh, in plates, so he worked in the printing press, th a sort of thing. Um, and as I say, was no, re renowned as a musical composer, did it on the side. And that left John, as in the poet Milton, with uh, an intense appreciation of music and uh, with friendships with musicians. When I say this, there, is, there are branches of Protestantism that were very skeptical of music. 
and, and concerned about it, uh, even uh, to the point where uh, they got rid of church musical instruments and sang a cappella without musical accompaniment. Um, and uh, Milton did not go that route. And likewise, so this is something that's interesting about, about Puritanism in general. There's a, a general portraiture of Puritanism that suggests there's an antipathy to the arts and art in general. And uh, we largely inherit that from the Victorians. There's a Victorian view of what Puritanism entails, uh, and it usually involves more of a psychological or a temperamental type of disposition. That it's a judgment on a type of personality as much as anything. It says more about the Victorians than anything, and we've inherited that same view of the Puritans uh, that the Victorians had without looking very carefully at what the P Puritans were actually uh, like. And when we do look at the Puritans, we'll find that there's enormous diversity amongst them on these fronts. Uh, Milton is probably the best representative of those who are on the, uh, who exalt the humanities. Obviously, uh, he writes the grand epic of the English language as a Puritan. So he does not abandon the arts. That will be for contemporary evangelicalism to do. Some who call themselves heirs of the Puritans ignore that Milton himself was a Puritan, uh, very devout in his religious life, but at the same time uh, devoted to a certain view of humanity, which he thought that Christ represented. And we'll see in his Nativity Ode that this understanding of the, of the cosmic significance of Christ's humanity is, is uh, brought into our attention. I'll, I'll come to that when we look actually at the Nativity Ode. But uh, his father, uh, having relocated to London, did rather well for himself, such that he could actually afford a private tutor for his son. So John was given a private tutor by the name of Thomas Young, who was a Scottish Presbyterian. Um, and he introduced uh, John to more radical Protestantism as a Presbyterian. Uh, Milton end, ended up at St. Paul's School in London, where he began to study Latin and Greek. And they left uh, a, an indelible imprint on his poetry, such that he even writes poetry in Greek and in Latin. That's part of his, his published poems. The first work uh, published edition of his poems was in 1645, by the way. And I should add that the Nativity, Nativity Ode was the first poem in the collection. So it's, and, and that's not insignificant. It's not the first poem that he ever published. The first poem that he ever published was on Shakespeare. And it was part of uh, Shakespeare's, uh, the second edition of Shakespeare's works. So that came out first, but uh, in the first of publication of his own collection of poems in 1645, the Nativity Ode was at the front of that. And normally you choose very carefully which poems come in which order. That, this was the first one. So not. Uh, that in itself is significant. Um, his first compositions, as far as we know, are uh, two psalms when he was about 15 years of age. And um, he, as I say, he went to St. Paul's. After St. Paul's, he went to Cambridge to Christ College, uh, renowned for its uh, devotion to Puritan life. Uh, he was known uh, as Our Lady of Christ's College. Uh, perhaps a reference to his appearance a little bit. He had long hair, fashionable long hair of the day, um, but also perhaps because of his puritanical uh, uh, morality. He was, a, he was no ways vulgar. He had no tolerance for it. He, he, right? So he was a very devout man, and maybe his appearance, and you can imagine uh, English schoolboys, they're all men, by the way, there's no women in the universities, commenting on him as Our Lady of Christ College meant rather tongue in cheek, but still. Uh, he did rather well, but uh, not as well as you might expect. He only finished fourth of all of the, f of the 24 that graduated, uh, went on to do NMA, preparing to be an Anglican priest. However, he did not uh, get there uh, to that point because he quarreled with his tutor and fell out with him and was uh, 
uh, and left. And um, uh, he probably got whipped for his, his quarrel with his tutor. So it says in his biographies at any rate, um, although some uh, others dispute that that actually occurred. At any rate, there's a significant fallout, whether it was because of religious matters or it was a personal dispute, not clear, but he was sent home from Cambridge because a plague was sweeping through. It's interesting, when you read poets and writers, you often miss the context, like we could miss the context of COVID. Stuff happened during COVID, and you would look at the publications or the speeches or the events, and you'd overlook those things, but it was most certainly there, and uh, in 1625, it meant that the city vacated uh, its, uh, its students. Um, but he was disdainful. He did not enjoy his university education, he w although he is renowned for his own uh, conspicuous learning. Uh, he thought that the curriculum in the university was not very good, not up to standard. As I say, he only finished fourth, but I don't think, again, that's a reflection of his abilities. But I, I happen to think that that's the case in uh, schooling in general. Marks are not a uh, sufficient indicator of talent. They're one indicator, but they're not the exhaustive one. So I always say that to people when they don't get the mark that they probably would think they deserve, and I might think they deserve, and the paper doesn't show it. It, it doesn't tell you everything. Um, but when he received his MA, and this is in 1632, so now he's 24 years of age, he leaves uh, or retires first of all to Hammersmith, where his father lives, and then spends six years on his own in private study. Obviously, he has the means to do that. His father's wealthy enough. But rather than do what most accomplished young men will do at that age, which is they'll put themselves into uh, either the church or into some sort of civil service, he decides that he needs to know more. He hasn't, he hasn't learned enough in university. Having got, gone and done the highest degree, they don't award doctorates back then. They, a master's degree, which is what he has, is sufficient to teach in the university. He decides he'll spend a further six years on his own in, in studies, privately directed studies. And um, he reads uh, theology, uh, philosophy, history, politics, literature, science, and he has in mind uh, possibly a political career. And you can read uh, some of his development. There's a commonplace book in uh, the British Library something like a scrapbook that talks about th these sorts of things there. Uh, but he is generally uh, thought, and I certainly uh, think, to be the most learned of all English uh, poets. And no wonder, after his formal degrees and then six years of private study, uh, particularly with the gifts that he had, you can only imagine. Now, when he's studying, he develops a command not only of Latin and Greek, but also of Hebrew, French, Spanish, Italian, and Anglo-Saxon. Uh, and he develops that when he's studying the history of Britain. He wants to read the documents in the original. Well, there are no translations. So he, he does the history of the English people. He reads the Anglo-Saxon chronicles. And he probably acquires a proficiency in Dutch at that along around the same time. Again, Dutch being uh, a Germanic language. And he writes poetry during this period and does so for a variety of patrons. Uh, but in uh, 1638, so this is uh, six, this, after those six years of study, he goes on the grand tour of Europe. Now, this is a, a sort of rite of passage for uh, the uh, English elite. They go to the continent and they go on a, a sort of a, a travel itinerary. He goes for 15 months, France and Italy. And along the way, he gets acquainted with something that he's not acquainted with in England so much, namely Roman Catholicism. He sees, because most of uh, France and Italy is Catholic, and those th to whom he, with whom he meets are uh, public intellectuals, and they are largely Catholics. So he engages with them in their language, corresponds with them 
usually in Latin because that's the language of uh, correspondence among the uh, European elites of the day. Rather than writing in one of the vernaculars, they write in Latin. And they are, uh, and he writes poetry which they greatly admire. They regard him as one of the great geniuses of England by that point. So his reputation is already sealed uh, in, during his grand tour. And uh, as far as the specifics of this, I'm not going to deal with it on the course. But if you wanted to look in this, you could look on into his Defensio Secunda, his second defense, which is a record of that grand tour that he made, among others, while he was there. Uh, he visited uh, Hugo Grotius, who's the great Dutch uh, philosopher of law, uh, also a playwright and a poet. Uh, he travels into Italy, as I say, and meets, among others, goes to, to Florence and visits the grand galleries there, and, uh, and goes also to visit Galileo, who's under house arrest. And as I say, he mentions that at various uh, points there. Uh, then goes on to Rome and meets all manner of the Italian poets and so forth, and they greet him as one of, your, uh, one of their own, uh, because he not only writes in English, he's writing Italian poetry to them. They praise him for his command of the Italian language, among other things. So he's already um, uh, in acquainting him himself, in other words, with a non-Puritan, um, not only religious milieu, but also a cultural one. So he, he goes and hears operas and oratorios and melodramas and uh, uh, wants to go on to Sicily and even to Greece. That's the plan. But then he hears um, the tidings of civil war brewing in England, and he comes back home for that reason. So out of a sense of duty and, uh, and commitment to the aims of those who were protesting against Charles the First's, first's um, tyranny, he goes back home. And when he goes back home, his friend, uh, childhood friend Charles Diodati dies. I'll get to that later when we uh, deal with that uh, in relation to a poem that arises out of it. Um, but he, um, as I say, goes back home. And when he returns back home, uh, he writes prose treatises against episcopacy. Episcus episcopacy is basically the rule of bishops in the church. Milton believes that there is no biblical warrant for this, that it ought not to be ruled in this fashion, and furthermore, that there ought not to be a national church. That will be a continual theme uh, to the end of the day. So he is actually warring now not about specifically about doctrine, in relation to Christ and so forth, but about church government even. In our day, we tend to, most people tend to want to not get involved in that sort of issue. Are you a Congregationalist, are you a Presbyterian, are you an Episcopalian? Um, who cares? If the gospel is preached, I'm not going to worry about the governance and so forth. Well, they care, the Puritans do. They believe that there is a form of government, that church government that Christ uh, uh, puts his stamp upon, and by ignoring that, they will not bring blessings upon themselves. So they're going to hold to that. Um, and during this time, he supports himself by being a private uh, school teacher, briefly, and writes the treatise of education that we'll look at in, in a few weeks. Ha with that experience of, of teaching behind him, not just from his own educational background, but from actually having out operated as a teacher, writes uh, the short tract of education, which is calling for a reform of the universities, of which there are only two at the time, Cambridge and Oxford says they need, there need to be more, and they, the ones that exist need to be reformed as well. And here's the proposal. Um, at that age, 1642, he's 34, uh, he marries a girl. How old is she? 17. Not uncommon in the day. Her name is Mary Powell. The marriage uh, got off to a very rocky start Milton was very austere in her life, his lifestyle. Mary was uh, born of considerable privilege and liked to enjoy herself a little bit. They didn't get along very well. The fact that he was double her age probably didn't help either. 
she wanted to have fun and he was already probably set in his ways actually i think he was born set in his ways and uh he found that there was they were intellectually incompatible she was a royalist i think why did he marry the girl she's <laughs> she's 17 he's 34 she's a royalist royalist he's a republican in his sensibilities and he's an anti-episcopalian she's an episcopalian like what uh, she, she goes back home to her parents and returns three years later in 1645, uh, probably because of the outbreak of the Civil War, because at that, it's in 1645 that the Civil War finally breaks into open hostilities. Uh, but during that time, and again, uh, it says something about Milton, he writes a number of pamphlets on the doctrine of divorce. But he does it on the basis uh, uh, not only of adultery, but of intellectual incompatibility and so forth. So these are, I, I just simply mention it to you, I don't defend it. Um, but uh, Milton got in trouble for these writings because again, he's surrounded in a puritanical context by those who are saying, uh, we believe in the authority of scripture, what are you saying here, Mr. Milton? Uh, and so he, he, there's the considerable possibility of, of conflict there, and that probably gave rise to the next uh, prose treatise that I, we're going to read, the most famous of them, Areopagitica, which is a defense uh, of the freedom of publication, free speech, the first one in the English language, probably the first one in any language. And it was written against the uh, fact that Parliament had just brought in a censorship bill. So he writes Areopagitica after the censorship bill has been published, which of course <laughs> pushes him right into the trigger hairs of the, of the Parliament that has just said, we're not going to allow these things. Well, I'm gonna write a defense of free speech in response to that. And in Areopagitica, he aligns himself with the parliamentarians having said that. And uh, then talks about why liberty ought to be allowed. I won't give away why that is because we're going to look into that. But he uh, courts another woman at this time. The woman turns him down and his, his wife, Mary, then returns to him. Maybe because of that, I have no idea. And in fact, she begs him to take her back and he does. And then they have two daughters. Uh, and the two daughters become very significant because they, when he is blind, will be his uh, amanuenses, one of them at any rate. She, they, he will dictate to her and she will write down. Now, he will educate them as well. They're, they're, they're formidably, formidably educated, his daughters. But again, Milton the, Milton the man is as interesting as Milton the poet as I say, is a very interesting age, he's an interesting and colorful character, and that's why I bring it to your attention. Now, when uh, the parliamentarians or the roundheads uh, win over the cavaliers or the royalists in the Civil War, uh, Milton again uses his pen to defend the Republican principles. So he writes in 1649 a work called The Tenure of Kings and Magistrates, and in that, he, he defends the right of the people to hold their government to account. Very interesting. And he implicitly sanctions the, the regicide that just happened. Implicitly. Later, it will be explicit. But here, it's only implicit. And because of this treatise, the, the, um, the Commonwealth government of Cromwell appoints him the Secretary of Foreign Tongues. So this is in 1649, and his main job description is to compose uh, the correspondence of the government to the other countries in Latin. So because of his proficiency in Latin, his capacity for persuasion, he will write correspondence to the other heads of state. Remember, there's no email, there's no phones, there's nothing. You write by correspondence, handwritten correspondence, and it will be then delivered to one another. So Milton is doing this on behalf of the government. It's not Cromwell who's doing it, he's got better things to do, but he needs to keep the other heads of state um, placated because they may 
in fact, they were saber rattling, maybe we need to invade this country and prevent what's happened there from happening here. And, uh, you know, these guys are out of control and Milton demonstrates why uh, what they did was justified and they seem to be placated by it. So he's successful in this. Now, in, so the, the, I said that in the tenure of kings and magistrates, it was an implicit uh, support of regicide. In the work Iconoclastes, it's explicit. I'll write it down because you wouldn't guess. It is explicit, an explicit defense of regicide. And it was in, it was in response to a, a pamphlet that was going about that was defending Charles I as a Christian martyr. So remember, this is an age in which we don't have, uh, obviously, internet, we don't have social media, we don't have anything of the sort. We have pamphlets, and the pamphlets then go to printing presses, and they get printed off, and that's how people find out. There are no, no newspapers, for that matter. No newspapers. So how do people find out information? Through pamphlets. Pamphlets are the primary means in which people are educated about the news that's going on in their day. So there are no news flash, never mind 24-hour news. There's no, nothing like even current news. The only way to disseminate information more broadly is through these pamphlets. Now the printing press has been uh, invented in the Gutenberg press in the late 15th century and it's been put to good use. And so Milton is producing these, uh, his pamphlet Iconoclastes, defending the regicide of the king against somebody who's just claimed that he's a Christian martyr, against these godless infidels uh, who are uh, opposed to episcopacy, etc. Right? And um, Charles II, the son of Charles I, uh, leaves England, goes to France, and he stays there until Cromwell's government falls, and he will eventually return thereafter, and that is a problem for Mr. Milton, among other things. But at this point, they put out a pamphlet um, defending the kingship of Charles I. Milton then responds in a pamphlet to that. So there's a lot of pamphleteering going on at this time. I just want to mention it to you. We're not going to cover it on the course. But in this, his political views are being presented. And I say, there, there's, so there's more to Milton than just the great poet. There is a sort of a uh, political theorist uh, rooted in scripture, uh, writing in this day, defending it. And these are very interesting. Uh, on the battlefield of the Second World War, there's also a, not the Second World War, the, of the Civil War, there's a, something called the Putney Debates which are arguing how uh, and in what form a Republican government ought to operate, how radical ought it to be. In the ranks of the uh, army are some called the levelers who think there should be no aristocracy at all. Everything should be devolved to the people. In other words, they're arguing for what we call democracy, one right for every person. Every man should have a vote. In the uh, aristocratic ranks of the Republican army are those who say that's crazy. And they are the ones that prevail in the end. We're not gonna go as far as the levelers that wanna level every aspect of society. No, we need to preserve and make sure that um, it's the educated and those who want to preserve something of social order that are in authority. Whereas the levelers really want raised earth like they really want to destroy society as it currently existed. In that sense, the levelers anticipate the French Revolution. Milton is not a leveler politically or socially. He is probably theologically. So he's against Episcopacy. He's also against the Presbyterians, by the way, for that matter. He's not with the Presbyterians. Probably not because of the Presbyterianism, but more because the Presbyterians in Scotland want to create a, a church of Scotland that's Presbyterian, but again, it's a national church. That's the issue. He thinks an, the idea of a national church is wrong. And that's what they had in, and this is what, what Cro led Cromwell to invade Scotland, is that this, uh, the Scots said, Cromwell, you have to, for the sake of a pure religion, uh, 
implement Puritanism in England as, or, or Presbyterianism in England as well. And Cromwell says, no, we're not going to do that. And the Scots say, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> we're going to make you so. And so then they, he goes up into Scotland and cracks some heads and does what Cromwell does. And then he does the same thing in the Ireland with, with the Catholic revolt that was happening there as well. Anyway, I don't need to get into all that. Uh, I won't say much more about that, but in the midst, so he's writing in these years um, pamphlets, uh, and he, so he spent how many years of his life? Close to 10, actually more than 10 uh, of his life writing political pamphlets, doing something that he probably had never imagined he was going to do. By 1652, he is dead blind. There's, he is totally blind. And... Uh, Scholars debate what the cause of that was, whether it was because his retina, both sides had been detached, by bi bilateral retinal detachment, or whether he had glaucoma. It's all speculative. But he had lost it, and he ended up having to dictate his uh, writing thereafter. One of those to whom he dictated it was the poet Andrew Marvell who ended up saving Milton's bacon when Charles II came back. Um, that's a little bit more complicated. Um, but, but Marvell had a political patron uh, whose name temporarily evades me, uh, Lord Fairfax. Lord Fairfax was the most important aristocrat in England uh, that opposed Charles I. He was the head of the, the Republican army. He defeated Charles I, but then when they said, we're going to execute Charles, he said, no way, I'm not, any, he, I'm not doing this. Because he saw the leveling effect of this, I'm not doing that. So because of that, and because Fairfax was the patron of Marvell, when Marvell interceded and the fact that uh, Fairfax was related to him, that probably was sufficient uh, to help preserve Milton's life, and as a consequence, give us the last three poems that he ever writes, namely Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, and uh, Samson Agonistes. But I think that's sufficient. I mean, there's a lot of things that I could write out in there and uh, would be worth looking into, but uh, it's very interesting in that. And he, at the end of his life, so in addition to those three great poems, uh, he writes a few minor prose works. He writes a grammar textbook. The Art of Logic, my philosopher colleagues would be interested in this. Uh, it was not considered to be something of no interest. He thought logic was extraordinarily important. Uh, and he also wrote, wrote his History of Britain. And uh, he, writes, uh, he, he also writes a political tract called uh, True Religion, arguing for religious toleration across the board, with the exception of the Catholics. Not going to have them, because it's because it's papacy or it's uh, it's the it's the antichrist, the common view of the Protestants in the day, that that they, they have wedded themselves to doctrine and to uh, a political agenda which is clearly opposed to Christ. So we can't tolerate that because this is beyond the pale. But uh, in other words, but but he is arguing for clemency and toleration to exist amongst all of uh, the the Protestants very much in a sense, at odds with the puritanical spirit of the day. This is more of an ecumenical spirit. Very interesting. Uh, so he dies in 1674. Uh, and the reasons why, not entirely uh, clear. Consumption, gout, who knows. But dies at that, at that stage. Uh, comments or questions about Milton? Very colorful character, needless to say. Yes, marries three times, by the way. So his first wife dies, he marries again, then marries again uh, late in life. I heard um, from this book, from his common opinion that he was an Arian, is it? In his, yes, because there's, yes, because uh, Arian and his Christology, because there, um, uh, a book on his uh, doctrine appears, allegedly his, in the 19th century. And there's a question of whether he denies the divinity of Christ there in that. Um, that's a de scholarly debate to this day. 
it's been accepted in the academy that he is. I think it's been accepted in the academy because it suits the academy to think of him as a heretic and to dispute some of his other features. You can see no hint of it in uh, Paradise Lost or any of his published works. But in the 19th century, a work appears on Christian doctrine, allegedly penned by Milton, uh, in which this uh, is stated. But again, it's not published in his day, so who knows what is going on with that, or who wrote it, or why, or what. Anyway, the, but the idea that he's Arian, I, I asked somebody else to find that for me in his published work, and I, I don't see it at all. Um, certainly not explicit, anything like explicit. But yes, thank you for asking that. Anyone else? Anything else? But so he, he sees it seen as a political reformer, as a defender of liberty, as a great epic poet, uh, as a patron of the arts, as a, a classical humanist with multiple languages, very ecumenical in his uh, religious leanings despite his Puritanism. And, uh, and that very much in keeping with Cromwell, despite Cromwell's reputation, Cromwell goes after people when they're not willing to tolerate others. And so he gets called intolerant and to some degree deserves the de reputation, but really um, it seems to me there's as much, he's as much sinned against as sinning in this. And, uh, and his legacy in terms of his effect on subsequent generations is pretty much without peer with the sole exception perhaps of William Shakespeare. So the, but those two are in the pantheon of English poets. I would say there, and there is no one more influential uh, on the romantics than Milton. Okay. <laughs>